February 1969, Hollywood heavyweight Tony Curtis is nominated for a Golden Globe for dramatizing one of America's most infamous serial killers, the Boston Strangler. In the film, George Kennedy plays Phil Di Natale, a city detective credited with catching the Strangler. But the real Phil Di Natale dies with his reputation in tatters. Amid claims he pinned one of the greatest crimes of the 20th century on the wrong man. Was Albert de Salvo wrongly accused? There were no witnesses to put him at the crime scene. There was no physical evidence to the crimes themselves. There was nothing. This is the tragic story of a Boston hero who dies believing his legacy is in the gutter. This is the untold story of the Boston Strangler by Philip J. Dean Natale. June 1962, and the sweltering streets of Boston's Back Bay neighborhood are bustling with people returning home from work. Above them, 55-year-old seamstress Anna Slessers is alone in her apartment. puts on her favorite opera, Tristan and Isolde, while she gets ready for her son Eurus to take her to church. But the knock comes early. First officer at the scene is rookie detective Phil De Natale. His first murder case is one he will never forget. Decades later, he recalls the moment. It began on June 14th of 1962, Ann Slessor's murder. This murder was the turning point, the greatest turning point, and the greatest thrill of my life. He finds Anna's room ransacked and her body laid out in a macabre, degrading pose. Around Anna's neck, the cord used to strangle her is tied in a flowing bow. She was there, exposed, her legs splayed. This was something that he recalled, like this was done for a very specific purpose. What kind of scene is this to walk into? Anna's son, Eurus, helps Di Natale piece the puzzle together. There's no sign of a break-in. Anna willingly let her killer into the apartment. Anna clearly had no idea that she had let in a demon. But the murder scene itself hinted that this was not merely a robbery gone wrong. Casey Sherman has written extensively about the murders. The Anna Slessor's murder scene was completely bizarre for investigators to stumble upon. It looked like a ransacked apartment. It looked like a robbery, but nothing was taken from the apartment. There were other clues buried in the chaos. Phil Di Natale's son, John, is a renowned private investigator in Boston. There wasn't a lot to go on, but he quickly thought the killer had to be left-handed. And that was because of the way things were thrown out of dressers that had been opened up the way a coffee cup had been left on the table, some of the, the bruising on some of the victims, indicative of somebody coming with a left hand from behind. But the left-handed monster left no prints, no murder weapon, and appeared to have no motive. For a rookie murder detective, it's a confusing scene. And it is just the beginning. The murder was the tip of an iceberg an iceberg that would create one of the biggest murder cases, not only in American history, but in the history of the world. It isn't long before Di Natale discovers just how big the iceberg really is. Two more murders follow in quick succession. Both follow the same macabre pattern. 68-year-old Nina Nichols is strangled at her apartment in Commonwealth Avenue. A giant bow wrapped around her neck and her body violated by a wine bottle. 
hours later in Lynn, Massachusetts. 65-year-old Helen Blake is found face down on her bed. A stocking and bra entwined around her neck in the same elaborate bow. One crime scene to the next were almost identical and no physical evidence, no sign of forced entry, no eyewitnesses. Nobody saw anybody leave the scene. These weren't just murders. They were macabre decorations. They were fantasies being lived out by the killer himself, positioning these defenseless victims in awkward ways, subjecting them to torture and humility and cruelty in a way that no other detective had seen that before. Soon there are more to the first three murders. Di Natale connects Ida Erger and Jane Sullivan, all following an identical pattern. Elderly white women living alone. But by winter, it becomes clear that no one will be safe. With 16 shopping days to Christmas, hospital nurse Sophie Clark is writing a letter to her fiancé. My dearest Chuck, may this letter find the man I love well. How is that cold of yours? I feel fine, especially after you called me last night. You're the kind of medicine I need. You make me feel well without putting in any effort. Darling, I hope you don't take this long to write again. You know how I get when I don't hear from you. I... The letter is never finished. Sophie Clark was, was a murder that was real warm. She went to work that morning on December the 5th of 1962, and she came back. And about an hour or two later, she was found dead. Six murders in six months. We gotta get this guy. No longer feeling protected by the police, women begin taking extreme measures to defend themselves. Boston was a very trusting place in the early 1960s. That all changed when women began to die at a very alarming rate. No one felt safe. Women used to sleep with ski poles under their mattresses. They would put up glass bottles against their doors so that if the strangler got in, at least they would have an alarm that would trigger them to get out of there as fast as they could. Dog pounds were literally being cleared out of stray dogs. Women that had never owned a pet before were now purchasing German shepherds. They were walking around with switchblade knives and hairpins that they could use to fend off an attacker. Women began to mobilize themselves and arm themselves really for the first time in American history. It is clear to the women of Boston that no one is safe. A sex predator is on the loose. And as fear turns to anger, the Boston police take the brunt. Susan Kelly is the author of The Boston Stranglers. The press generated a lot of hysteria, and you know, it was like throwing a glass of acid. It splashes everywhere and, and hits everything. The police were being called incompetent bums all the time. Why have you need to touch him? You're you used to move on. They don't do this. Why haven't you got anybody? Come on, seriously. What are you doing? You must work hard. It's getting serious. Useless. Your job is to protect him. For Phil in particular, the public's anger is an especially bitter pill to swallow. He is from a family with a proud history in the Boston Police Department. A family who have protected the city for generations. In 1950, Phil's father, Salvatore, solved America's biggest heist at the time, the Great Brinks Robbery. 
Right then and there, I made up my mind I was going to become a police officer like my father and the rest of my brothers. After returning from World War II, Phil and his brothers become police officers. But the family had to fight hard to break through in a police force dominated by Irish Americans. There was always this kind of underlying little, well, there's, you know, there's the Italian. Miles Jewell is Phil's grandson. It was a very Irish police force. Here you have this, you know, Italian fellow trying to, you know, work his way up the ranks. And so there's a little bit of animosity. When Phil was offered a breakthrough assignment as a detective, he smelt a rat. The Boston Public Gardens, one of the oldest public gardens in the country. But at night, they can turn into, you know, difficult places to be. And back then, they were being uh, harassed by what they call them, purse snatchers. He was being sent undercover to catch muggers. But it wasn't the role he was expecting. I just went up in the air and down on the ground and screamed at him, you're no lady. And he says, that's right, you're under arrest. On his first night, Phil and his partner Jimmy make an arrest. It is clear that the young Italian cop will do whatever it takes. It's a lesson soon learned by a local gang terrorizing the neighborhood. The hoods see nothing to fear in two Boston cops without backup. They had screwdrivers and chains and brass knuckles. The guy's under arrest. So what you gonna do? There's a moment at which Phil says to Mellon, you know, you better call an ambulance. <laughs> and they say, yeah, the ambulance is for you. And he said, no, it's for you guys. They arrested all five, and neither one of them ever pulled their gun. No matter who you were or how much you hated Phil, he was going to earn your respect. Punks! They were both awarded the Thomas Sullivan uh, Medal of Honor, which is the highest award in the Boston Police Department. Serious, seriously! Di Natale's battle for recognition is finally rewarded with a strangler investigation. Immediately, his hard-earned reputation is under the spotlight. Everybody was willing, and everybody donated many, many, many precious hours of their own time to work on this case. It was just unbelievable where we couldn't come up with any kind of a clue. It's just like the man would be the shadow. And the shadow is about to commit his most shocking crime yet. January 1964. The Boston Strangler has eluded the lead detective for 17 months. In that time, he has killed 11 women. The latest is Mary Sullivan, killed just days before her 20th birthday. For Casey Sherman, the murder is profoundly personal. My Aunt Mary Sullivan was a beautiful young woman. She was funny, she was bright, she was a friend to everyone that had known her. Mary's murder created a hole, not just in my family, but in an entire community. Anybody that met her for the first time was immediately drawn to her because of her wit, because of her charm, and because of her beauty. been strangled with three ligatures, two scarves and a nylon stocking, all wrapped very tightly around her neck. She had also been sexually assaulted with a broomstick. While the identity of the strangler remains a mystery, every man becomes a suspect. People in Boston became very paranoid about friends, neighbors, acquaintances. 
uh, anybody who was a little bit off or just slightly eccentric in some way. There was one incident of a woman who had a, an ex-boyfriend or a man friend of some sort whom she was convinced was the strangler because he used a pogo stick. Over 400 suspects are questioned. All will be released. They were at a loss on how to figure out how to solve this. I mean, they just had no ideas. I mean, like, literally none. What in the world was going on here? I mean, it's completely twisted. The murders take a toll on the proud detective. One crime scene to the next were almost identical in, in as much as no physical evidence, no sign of forced entry, no eyewitnesses, nobody heard anything, nobody saw anybody leave the scene. Those were all the kind of things that, that kept my father up at night. Phil De Natale could never escape the killings. He would become quite sullen, quite depressed. Uh, but also you could see kind of like a grit that he and everybody else had. But it was that grit that was like, OK, we'll get to the bottom of this. We were desperate for clues, and we listened. I'll listen to the garbage man if he has something to tell me. And I'll even be nice to the devil if he can give me the information that I'm looking for and bring me about the solution of the strangling. This wasn't my shift's over at 4 o'clock, I'm going home. It was his life. I mean, uh, it, it really took precedent over almost anything in his life. Uh, I don't know that at that period of time that he came to maybe one of my baseball games. He just had this all-encompassing tunnel vision that wouldn't let him away from this. With the pressure mounting, De Natale's health is in jeopardy. That was a period of time that I think affected him, not so much emotionally, but, all, but, but physically. As each murder occurred, it was almost as if, you know, somebody was turning up the volume on a, on a pressure cooker. He suffered a heart attack uh, midway through this investigation, and clearly the result of stress. Hospital. The heart attack forces Di Natale to take a break. But even in the hospital, he can't let go. Here he is, you know, sick as a dog, uh, suffering potentially heart failure, and he's still investigating. And there was something about Longwood Hospital that rang a distant bell. Did you say earlier Longwood Hospital? Yes, sorry. You are in Longwood Hospital. Everything somehow, some way, was going was gonna to connect him back to, to what he was trying to do. Di Natale was sure that one of the Strangler victims worked at Longwood, Sophie Clark. A Sophie Clark ring a bell? She was a student nurse here at this hospital, wasn't she? Why are you, why are you talking about The question Sophie? sparks an unexpected Sophie response. Clark. You need to rest. Excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Natale soon discovers that something was spooking the staff at Longwood. Oh, great. How are you feeling? Yeah, not too bad. So, um, did you know Sophie Clark? Later that afternoon, another technician came up, and I started talking to her about uh, Sophie Clark. Well, I'm telling you, she dropped everything in the pan she had been carrying and ran out of the room. The nurses know more than they are letting on. In the middle of the night, the detective gets a call. Detective Dinatale. A man is calling on behalf of a terrified nurse. He claims that she was raped and gives Phil the name of the man she claims did it. Albert DeSalvo. DeSalvo? The investigation 
is in its second year, and hundreds of names have passed across Phil's desk. But DeSalvo wasn't one of them. It is clear that the nurses who knew Sophie Clark live in terror. Could the cause of that terror be Albert De Salvo? Di Natale needs to know about him, and fast. After almost two years, lead detective Phil Di Natale finally has a lead in his hunt for the Boston Strangler. He checks himself out of the hospital and travels to the house of the new suspect, Albert De Salvo. De Salvo's record shows he is a handyman living in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood with his wife and two kids. But currently, he is detained in Bridgewater State Mental Hospital for reasons yet unknown. He starts to think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start checking this guy out. Has there ever been a parking ticket? What other criminal re records does this person have? De Salvo's criminal history is the stuff of nightmares. His rap sheet lists multiple minor juvenile offenses, breaking and entering. But most shocking is that he became known as the Measuring Man, gaining access to the homes of single women and violating them. Phil is particularly intrigued by how the Measuring Man gained access to the woman's apartments. He would go around to women's doors, knock, and say, the powers agency was given your name as a possible model. And they've asked me to come and get some measurements. And he would get them to put on a leotard or nothing and measure them in all the classic places, around the chest, around the waist, the thighs. And he would, unbeknownst to them, often have an orgasm while that was going on. De Salvo had a long history of sex crimes against women. Yet somehow his name had never cropped up in relation to the Boston Strangler. Now, Albert DeSalvo was not on a list of suspects that was 3,000 names long. No one had ever even known he existed. It isn't long before DeSalvo's perverted con takes a violent twist. October 27th, 1964. A woman from Cambridge describes her attacker. I need to report a rape. He was wearing a green work outfit. Somehow, DeSalvo had never appeared on the suspect list. Phil needs to know why. Phil's chief has bad news. They said, Phil, he's not your guy. He'd been in jail in, in the House of Correction for two years, and therefore he was in jail for maybe the first six or seven murders. He couldn't have been the strangler. Most cops would have left things there. But something in Phil believes De Salvo is too perfect a suspect. Surely, there had been a mistake. So he wasn't going to take anyone's word for the fact that Albert was in jail because he liked him. He liked him as a suspect. And now this was all going down the tubes because somebody told him that he's not your guy because he was in jail. So he went to the source. Phil travels to the city courts to check De Salvo's files for himself. You didn't punch somebody's name and date of birth into a, into a computer and up pop their criminal history. Off he goes to the court in Cambridge, and he goes in and explains, I want to look at this guy's record. But when he finds it, it's not what he wants to read. It appears his team was right. were they? As he gathers up the records, he notices a faint stamp that everyone else has missed. De Salvo was released early on good behavior, days before Anna Slessers was murdered. The Boston Strangler's first victim. Phil heads straight to Bridgewater to interview Albert De Salvo, who is incarcerated for sex crimes. But Phil can't get close. De Salvo has hired a lawyer, renowned attorney F. Lee Bailey. 
I was representing a fellow charged with murder. Albert DeSalvo was in the next room to him and asked if he could arrange for me to meet. And this fellow said, you know, I think DeSalvo was something big, I don't know what. Albert DeSalvo's early life explains a great deal of how he became a mindless assassin. His father was a brute. He used to beat up the mother or bring prostitutes home and have games with them in the wife's bed. He taught his son to be a thief at age six, taught him to have sex with his sister when he was seven. But the man he meets is nothing like the monster he had come to expect. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Bailey. I thought that he was a very ordinary looking serviceman who used to go around and do fixes on stoves and dishwashers and things like that. But when DeSalvo started talking, Bailey realized why single women might be happy to let him into their homes. He's the kind of fellow who wouldn't hesitate to invite into your home to have dinner with the family. He was about the last thing in the world you'd expect to fill in the ghostly picture of what the Boston Strangler would look like. The interrogation is taken over by the district attorney's office. The floodgates open, and DeSalvo starts to tell his story. He confesses to 13 Strangler murders, claiming two more than Phil Di Natale even knew about. What's more, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of every crime scene. At last, Phil learns how the killer got into the victim's apartments. He would knock on the door and say, your landlord has sent me. It appears that your lease requires that you get a new refrigerator. And women who heard something like that, knowing full well they had no right to a refrigerator, opened the door. And once he got inside, needless to say, he never looked at any refrigerators, but he always talked his way in. DeSalvo reveals details never reported in the newspapers, details surely only the murderer would know. He knew that Anna Slessers was listening to Tristan and Isolde, and that before he left, he had turned the sound on the record player down. Sophie Clark was strangled to death. DeSalvo was asked, what was under the stuffed chair near her body? He said, a tampon. I pulled it out of her. What was behind the bureau out of sight? He said, a box pack of Marlboro cigarettes. I knocked them off by mistake and didn't pick them up. No pictures that the public ever saw had that information, but the police file did. After thousands of leads and hundreds of interviews, Phil Di Natale's painstaking attention to details others overlooked has paid dividends. The Boston Strangler is behind bars. But the case will come back to haunt him in ways he could never imagine. November 1973, eight years after Di Natale caught the Boston Strangler, Albert de Salvo, one of the 20th century's most feared serial killers is murdered in his cell. Someone with a shiv, a knife made in the prison wall somehow, uh, stabbed him in the heart and killed him. Prison justice carried out by an inmate on a notorious sex criminal was not unusual. But the night before he was murdered, De Salva did something that made headlines around the world. De Salvo reaches out to the prison psychiatrist. He called Ames Roby, the forensic psychiatrist, and said, can you come to the prison tomorrow? I need to talk to you. Dr. Roby told me that, that De Salvo sounded extremely agitated, and he asked, OK, what, you know, what do you want to talk to me about? And De Salvo said, I want to tell you the truth. And Dr. Roby said, OK, I'll be down there tomorrow morning. 
Now, Albert DeSalvo was a very curious criminal. He was a sexual con man, he was a rapist, and he was a thief. The question is, was he homicidal? Was he a killer? Albert Salvo was then under arrest for a number of crimes that did not involve murder where the witnesses were going to identify them. He knew he was gone, but he didn't want to go to the electric chair in the process, and that was the conundrum he handed me to Saul. Journalist Susan Kelly discovered that despite his confessions, many in the police force never believed DeSalvo was the strangler. As I talked to more and more people, the, the, the conversation would come around inevitably. Who do you think the Boston Strangler was? Apparently, this is like one of the largest <laughs> non-secret, <laughs> open secrets in Boston area law enforcement because no one I talked to, no one thought DeSalvo was the strangler. Kelly had an unconventional idea. Might DeSalvo have been killed to hide the identity of the real Boston Strangler? Overnight, Di Natale's proudest professional achievement was suddenly thrown into doubt. Out of nowhere, small details in his confession were questioned. Like the fate of the knife DeSalvo claimed he used to kill Beverly Siemens at her home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He said that he had brought the knife with him and that he stabbed her. Uh, he got the number of right times he stabbed her, radically wrong, and then took the knife and threw it into a swamp in one of the western suburbs. Well, the knife was there on the drain board of the kitchen in the apartment. With DeSalvo's confession showing intriguing inconsistencies, alternative theories began to arise. Critics pointed to the fact that Already facing a life sentence as a serial rapist, DeSalvo was never actually tried or convicted for the strangler crimes. Furthermore, no physical evidence ever linked DeSalvo with any of the murder scenes. Confessions aside, there were no fingerprints, no eyewitnesses, nothing at that time. DeSalvo's confession is picked apart. Susan Kelly argues that DeSalvo's questioning broke basic police protocol. They asked very leading questions. He would say something like, tell me how you killed so-and-so, or did you do this when you killed so-and-so? And he kind of fed DeSalvo a lot of his material. What struck me was how inaccurate it was. So why would an innocent man incriminate himself? I said, he'll help you, he'll show that he did these murders, and the price you must pay as you can't kill him. That's all you have to do. DeSalvo could make some money on the, the sale of his life story to various magazines and to the movies. I started to create a profile of Albert DeSalvo being somebody that was a con man, somebody that was a sexual predator, but somebody that was willing to say anything and do anything to get what he wanted. And what Albert DeSalvo wanted was money. Preston could do a lot for ten thousand dollars. If DeSalvo wasn't the strangler, who was? One man neatly ties up all of the loose threads. Albert DeSalvo shared a cell with known murderer George Nasser. All right, strangler. George Nasser was the tip of the spear for the Boston mob during the early 1960s. He was violent, but he was brilliant. And he was DeSalvo's cellmate at Bridgewater State Hospital. Now, George Nasser lived in the south end of Boston in the heart of the Boston Strangler kill zone. When police raided his apartment, they found uniforms, doctor's uniforms, police uniforms, uniforms that would have given him access to buildings in the city, uniforms that would have given him the trust of women. Could NASA have fed DeSalvo information about his crimes, the details that so impressed the cops? While the idea gained ground, Phil Di Natale was helpless to protect his reputation. So Phil felt that 
folks that were coming up with these alternative theories were essentially, it was a lack of respect for the work that all these detectives had done. And that's what gives me a cancer. And I've had it ever since. Eventually, his failing health catches up with him. On the 25th of January, 1987, Phil Di Natale dies of heart failure. I don't think that when he died, based on his close participation in all phases of the case, there was a shred of a doubt in Phil's mind that Albert was the strangler. Indeed, Phil is probably the first detective to be convinced of that. Di Natale died knowing that his most famous case was now in doubt. It will take over two decades before decisive evidence proves who is the Boston Strangler. It's 2012, 50 years since the Strangler killed his final victim, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, violating her body with a broomstick. Police forensic scientist Donald Hayes is clearing up old cases when he comes across a photo of the crime scene. I observed a blanket in the crime scene photos that was in between the legs of Mary Sullivan as she was lying on the bed at the homicide crime scene. It was apparent to me, looking close up and magnifying in the areas of the blanket, that there appeared to be staining on the blanket, which was one of the items I was very interested in looking at. At the time, the police bemoaned the absence of any physical evidence of the crime scenes. The advent of DNA profiling changed the rules entirely. Suddenly, a single hair or a drop of blood was enough to link an individual to a crime scene. Remarkably, 38 years after the murder, Hayes finds a blanket in the evidence box. We have the blanket, we have our clothes, we have the broom handle, we have uh, swabs, we have an appropriate, useful, probative level of evidence on Mary Sullivan that was still in Boston police custody. At the time, Hayes was most concerned with testing the long-running rumors. So there was a theory out there that George Nasser was responsible for the Boston Strangler murders. In 1998, prisoners had their DNA stored in a national database. Because George Nasser was a convicted felon, he would be in that database. So we searched that profile, and we got no hits or links to anyone in that database. The results were conclusive. George Nasser was excluded at that point as a source of the DNA we found in the murder of Mary Sala. With NASA ruled out as the strangler, attention turned to the affable Boston handyman. Could Albert DeSalvo be linked directly to the murder scene? But Dugan and Hayes had a problem. DeSalvo had been killed before criminals had been required to provide DNA for the database. Their only hope was to find a close relative. In our attempts to locate a known male family member of Albert DeSalvo from which to collect a, a DNA sample from which we could develop a Y chromosome and try to match it to the evidentiary sample, in doing the research, we found that the brother, he had sons, that would be nephews of Albert DeSalvo, right down the same male lineage of the family. Plainclothes investigators tracked down Albert DeSalvo's nephew. They were working down on Cape Cod, so we had our investigators follow them. When the moment comes, they swoop in. But they are not interested in stopping DeSalvo's nephew. They want his DNA. Investigators collected that water, those water bottles, and we got a DNA sample. The results are tantalizing enough for investigators to request that DeSalvo's body be exhumed.
for an in-depth evaluation. Armed with the new evidence, Hayes convinces a judge to allow him to exhume DeSalvo's body for testing. DNA is extracted from his left femur. Could they get a perfect match from DeSalvo's DNA? I was on the golf course and I turned on my cell phone and then, you know, I got bing, 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 bing. And I'm thinking, well, what the hell's going on? You know, I got like 13 text messages and another 25 emails. And, and then the phone's ringing and it's my wife. She said, have you heard? They did DNA testing. They just had a, a, a press conference and Albert was found to have killed Mary Sullivan. And I was like, oh, you know, I was overjoyed. I truly was overjoyed. The science shows that Albert DeSalvo's DNA matches the semen samples found at Mary Sullivan's crime scene with a one in 220 billion chance of error. There is no dispute. Albert DeSalvo raped and murdered Mary Sullivan on January the 4th, 1964. I've lived with Mary's memory every day my whole life. And um, I didn't know, nor did my mother know, that other people were living with her me memory as well. And it's amazing to me today to understand that people really did care about what happened to my aunt. The evidence that we were able to bring to light completely vindicate Phil Di Natale. He was absolutely correct, 100%. Um, he was wrong about nothing. He was right. He just didn't have the science that we have today. For 27 years, Phil's family lived with the knowledge that he died with his reputation dragged through the mud. At last, they could be released from their nightmare. Phil's theories were finally proved correct. At the time of his death, Phil Di Natale, great detective, great investigator, I thought about Phil and I thought, oh, you know, this would have been his day. I'm sure he didn't have the closure of knowing that justice had been done to Albert Tosalvo. For 20 years, you know, he went around with people taking pot shots at him. He knew Albert was guilty. He was right. I said, I'm gonna go to my dad's grave because I'm sure the dirt's all turned over because he's just turned over in his grave because he's gonna be so happy about this. Mary Sullivan's murderer was Albert DeSalvo. Given the similarities between this murder and the others, the question of the Boston Strangler has finally been put to rest. There is no doubt that the Di Natale family have another police hero in their ranks. My father always wanted to be a police officer. I think he probably cherished his badge right after his family. He loved his badge. He loved, he loved being a cop. He was right. You know, at the end of the day, he was right. He would have been satisfied that justice had been done. <laughs>